Sir Vang, if you could please state your first and last name and spell both for the court reporter, please. Mark Vang, M-A-R-K-V-A-N-G. Oh. Officer Vang, how are you employed? With the City of Eau Claire Police Department. As a police officer? Yes, sir. How long have you been a police officer? Five years. All with the Eau Claire Police Department? Yes. Were you working February 26, 2018? I was. Were you dispatched to 1118 State Street, Apartment 2 in Eau Claire? I was. What was the nature of that call? Me and another officer were dispatched there for a uh, check person's call. Do you know the person, do you know who made the call? Yes. Who was that? Joshua Trinkler. And is that, if you recall, T-R-E-A-N? K L E R. Yes. Did you speak with Ezra McCandless when you arrived? I did. Is the person you spoke with and identified as Ezra McCandless in the courtroom today? She is. Can you identify where she's located by describing a location and an article of clothing, please? She is sitting at the defense table wearing a pink um, jacket. It Record will reflect uh, that the witness has identified uh, Ms. McCandless, the defendant. Thank you. Did you have an opportunity to not only have contact with the defendant, but also speak with her? I did. Uh, where did that discussion initially start? It started on State Street, but then she requested to speak with me at the police department. And you said she requested that? Correct. Did you accommodate that request? I did. Did she say why she wanted to go to the police department? She just wanted to speak somewhere in private. Uh, how did you get, how did you and the defendant get to the police department? I drove her in my squad car to the police department. Was there an interview that was continued once you got to the police department? There was. Where within the department was that? in the interview room in the police department. Now at this point was, um, was the defendant being treated as a suspect of any kind? No. What was her role in the call as far as you were concerned at that point? A victim. During that interview, did the defendant describe a number of different incidents to you? She did. Uh, and who was the person other than her that was involved in those incidents? A person by the name of John Hansen. Now, were there a total of three incidents? Yes. Let's start with the, the first incident that she described. Did the defendant say where that occurred? She did. Where was that? At 135 Broadway Street. Did the defendant tell you approximately when in relation to the interview that incident occurred? About a week prior. What did the defendant explain to you about what happened during that initial incident? At the Broadway Street address, she was home at that residence with a John Hansen. There at the kitchen counter, John grabbed Ezra with his right hand. Now, let's just step back a second. Whose residence was that, if you know? Jason Mengels. Did the defendant describe to you the relationship at that time between her and Jason Mengel? She did. What was that relationship? Boyfriend and girlfriend. Uh, was that both at the time of the incident as well as at the time of the interview? Yes. Was Jason Mengel home at the time of the incident, as described by the defendant? No, he was not. Uh, was there anybody else besides John Hansen and the defendant at the, the Broadway Street address, according to the defendant, when the incident occurred? No one else was home. And you said it started at the kitchen counter, is that correct? Yes. And you said that um, the defendant stated John Hansen grabbed her by the throat, is that right? Yes. Did the defendant describe what John Hansen did while grabbing her by the throat, according to her? That he squeezed her throat 
which caused her pain, had a hard time breathing, and caused her to cough. Did the defendant tell you whether or not she told John Hansen to stop? She did not. She did not tell you or she did not tell him? She did not tell him. Um, did she tell you whether or not she tried to fight John Hansen off? She told me she did not. Did the defendant tell you what she did immediately after John Hansen, uh, according to her, grabbed her by the throat? She placed her hands on his wrist. Did she push herself away or back away? She told me she did not. What did, according to the defendant, John Hansen do next? He released his grip and then she backed away and then he then put her in a headlock. According to the defendant, what did she do next? She did not fight back and she only put her hands up. According to the defendant, did John Hansen release her? He did. And according to the defendant, what did she do? She went and sat down on a couch. Again, according to the defendant, what did John Hansen do at that point? He acted like nothing happened and did not apologize to her. According to the defendant, did Jason Mengel ever come home? He did. Uh, when did that occur in relation to the physical contact as stated by the defendant? Shortly after um, Jason came home. Did the defendant tell you whether or not she told Jason what she claimed happened? She did not. She did not tell you or she did not tell Jason? She did not tell Jason. Did she say why she didn't tell Jason? She told me that she felt scared and ashamed. <clears throat> During your contact with the defendant, did you see any bruising or injuries on her? I did not. Is that something you would look for given the nature of what was being discussed? Yes. Uh, now let's move on to uh, the second incident that the defendant described to you. Where did that occur? At the address outside of city of Eau Claire. Uh, whose residence was that according to the defendant? John Hansen's. Uh, when did that incident occur? According to her, a couple days after the first incident. According to the defendant, how did, um, well, was, was this another incident between John Hansen and the defendant, according to her? Yes. How did the, the two come in contact, according to the defendant? Ezra was invited to John's residence, and John was the one who picked it up and brought her there. Did the defendant say why John invited her to the residence? To talk about what happened. Did the defendant tell you whether Jason Mengel was around the area during that second incident? No, she stated that he was off at training. Was that military training? Yes. Did the defendant tell you what time John Hansen picked her up? Around 7 p.m. And then he, according to the defendant, drove the two of them to his house? Yes. According to the defendant, what did they do when they arrived at his house? They both started drinking and got intoxicated. Did the defendant tell you what level of intoxication she was under. She told me that she got out to the um, blackout drunk. Did she say whether or not she got sick? She also indicated that she was um, throwing up as well. Did the defendant tell you if anybody else was home besides her and John Hansen? She did not mention anyone else. What did the defendant tell you happened next? That John brought her up to his room where he then turned the lights off and they were now both on his bed. 
Did the defendant tell you whether she was still sick at that point in time? Yes, she indicated that she was still throwing up at that time. What did the defendant tell you happened next? She felt someone lay on top of her. Was she able to tell you who she thought that person was? She believed it was John, even though the lights were turned off. What did the defendant tell you happened next? That sexual intercourse took place between her and John. Did the defendant tell you what, if anything, according to her, John said to her during that sexual intercourse? That he told her to be quiet and to be a good little girl. Did the defendant tell you that she eventually fell asleep? Yes. And did she tell you where she woke up? She told me that she woke up on John, in John's bed with John laying next to her. Did she say anything about the clothing that she was wearing according to her? Yes, she indicated that her socks, underwear, and tights were off on the floor and that she was only wearing her dress. Did the defendant tell you um, if John Hansen gave her any directions once she woke up? She indicated that John told her to leave his bedroom and go to a different bedroom so that his roommate wouldn't think of anything else. Did the defendant tell you whether she complied with that request? She did. She said she went to a different room and laid in a different bed. What did she tell you happened uh, after she laid in that different room in a different bed? That around 10 a.m. or 11 a.m., John then took her back to Jason's residence. And that's the 135 Broadway Street address? Yes. So this would have been the day after the night drinking at John's house, correct? Yes. Um, and does that take us to the third incident as reported by the defendant? Yes. What did the defendant tell you happened when she and John Hansen pulled up to Jason Mengel's residence? that John realized that Jason was not home and that John told her to go upstairs to Jason's, Jason's room with him. Did the defendant tell you if John, according to her, gave her any other directions other than to go to the room? Well, only to go to John's room and then to take her clothes off. Did the defendant tell you whether or not she did so. She told me she did. Did she tell you why? She told me because she felt like garbage. Did she tell you or give you an explanation of why she thought that John did that? She indicated that John did that because he gets off, of, off from it. And those were her words or similar to those? Correct. Did the defendant tell you what John directed her to do, if anything, once in Jason's room? To perform oral sex. Did the defendant tell you whether she did that or not? She told me she did. And during this incident, is it your understanding that Jason was still on military leave? Yes. Did the defendant tell you whether or not she and John Hansen had sexual intercourse in Jason's room? She told me they, they did. Did she tell you whether, according to her, John Hansen wore any protection? No protection was used. And did she say whether or not John Hansen ejaculated inside of her vagina? She told me he did. Did the defendant tell you whether or not she either fought off John Hansen or told him no? She did, told me she did not. How did she describe what 
John Hansen had done to her. She indicated, she indicated to me that he used me. After the sexual intercourse occurred, did the defendant tell you where John Hansen went, if anywhere? Yes, John went to a coffee house called Racy's to get, to get coffee. Did he ever come back, according to the defendant? He never came back. Uh, did the defendant remain at Jason's apartment while, uh, while John Hansen went to get coffee, according to her? She did. What did she say that she did in the apartment after John left? She indicated that she went to autopilot mode and remained in the residence. And autopilot were those words that she used? Yes. Did she say whether she took a shower and got dressed? Yes, she indicated that she also took a shower and got dressed. Did the defendant tell you whether or not she had continued uh, or whether John Hansen had text messaged her subsequent to the incidents we've talked about? He has. According to the defendant, what did John Hansen tell the defendant to do or uh, if anything? To erase the text messages that he's been sending her to protect him. Did the defendant say whether or not she actually deleted text messages? She told me she did. During this interview, approximately how long was that initial part where she talked about those incidents? About an hour. Um, and that's a recorded interview, is that right? Yes. Um, and your testimony today, is that consistent with what you've been able to review on that recorded interview? Yes. Now, in that interview, um, how would you describe the defendant's demeanor? And I can ask you some specific questions. Was she crying? Yes. Was she upset at times? Yes. Was she emotional? Yes. Um, did she ever ask for Jason Mengel? She did. Um, was that during the interview? It was. Did she make any specific requests as it relates to Jason Mengel? She wanted Jason there with her. Was that once or more than once during the interview? More than once. Did she say why she wanted Jason there? I don't recall. Do you recall her saying that she felt safe when Jason was there? Yes. Was Jason allowed to come into the interview room after your initial interview had been completed? He was. Um, have you had an opportunity to either review in live, real time from outside of the interview room or review recordings of the interview when Jason was in the room? I have. And is that which one of the two, in live time or uh, after the fact? Partially real time and after the fact. Now, during the time that Jason was in the interview room, did he ever offer to, to step out and allow the defendant to have privacy? He did. Um, what did the defendant say? She wanted him to stay in the room with her. Now, when you were interviewing the defendant, you said she was being, at that point, considered a victim, right? Yes. Did you tell her that she had to talk to you? No. Did you tell her that she could leave if she wanted to? Yes. Did you tell her that she could uh, tell you she didn't want to answer a specific question, one or another? Yes. Okay, and you kind of told her that she was able to control whether she was involved in that interview or not, correct? Correct. Nothing further, thank you. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna take a recess. Uh, hopefully it's not real long. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna say, how long would you like, Mr. Nelson? 15 minutes, enough time? 15 minutes. Okay, then we will uh, uh, take a 15 minute recess. Okay, you may be excused, all rise. Yet to be marked Exhibit 683, the state has agreed that I can create from uh, the digital file that I have now onto a thumb drive and give it to the clerk over lunch break, but just in the sake of time uh, that this recording will be marked Exhibit 683.
I'm going to play it from my computer. There are uh, times uh, that we have agreed that I can stop and fast forward or mute. I'm providing Your Honor with a copy of that list. I believe the state's preference is for me to just explain essentially what's on here to the jury. I've started it at 217.34 because Mr. Vang was not in the room until then. I've stopped it, you know, and then, Your Honor, I'm muting it for you this mean time. 2017? Yes, I misspoke, but that's the okay. idea, is that I would, rather than ask the witness questions, that I would just say, Judge, I'm going to stop it here, I'm going to start it here, because there is no, Mr. Vang isn't in the room, there's no questions being asked of her. Does that sound appropriate? So if I have this right, you're going to go ahead and do that, be playing these uh, during cross-examination now, and then you are going to make a thumb drive containing those portions of the audio recording. I will make a thumb drive including the entire recording, and we'll make the sheet that Your Honor has, sorry for pointing at you, uh, Exhibit 683B, which is the, uh, con you know, the table of contents for the portions that were played. Um, as best as I can, the version that I have on my computer, and I think it's the same version that the state has, doesn't give me the time as I'm sliding across. It just gives me one minute tick marks. Okay. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to hit second marks. Um, All right. Well, my understanding is that it's being condensed to save time and agreed. not waste time. Uh, but there, there's nothing particularly... Uh, Prejudicial, so if you do miss a little bit, it's not not going to be a, a big problem. Correct. Correct. I would probably err on the side of playing 30 seconds when she's in the lone room alone, rather than start it up too late when there's content being provided. Yes. All right. All right. And uh, Mr. Hahn, is that uh, your understanding of uh, your understanding? <laughs> yes, Judge. The index. I think this is. Defense counsel's intent, that's just a guide for completion of the record, not something that would go to the jury or be published or be even marked as an exhibit. Unless it's just a sub-exhibit, that's fine. Okay. However Your Honor wants to handle it, I think we should, it should be part of the record. All right. But I agree, it doesn't need to go to the jury. The second portion, again, the recording is 55 minutes. I'm trying to condense it. Um, I understand it's the state's preference that if after I play the tape, we can conclude Mr. Vang's cross-examination prior to taking a lunch break. I have some questions to ask after the tape is done, but it's obviously most of the content is in here, and so I'm going to be, hopefully, I understand you may uh, disagree, but I hope to be a short cross. Very well, okay, ready to proceed? Yes, sir. All right, then uh, let's bring the jury in. All right, Mr. Nelson, then uh, you may go ahead with your cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. The defense moves for uh, the admission of Exhibit 683, which is a recording of the first 55 minutes of Mr. Vang's interview of Ezra McCandless on February 26, 2018. No objection. Exhibit 683 will be received. Um, okay, you may go ahead. Judge, uh, permission to publish? You may. Um, I'd ask the screen be turned on so I can play the... Uh, do you actually mind sitting in that chair quickly? And I'll move up the rest of the chairs in that way. If you need anything, water, or a snack, I'll try. I'll, I'll do what I can get it for you, okay? All right, so my name is Mark. Hi. Um, I feel quite determined. Uh, before we begin, like I said, you're, you're free to leave anytime you want. You can stop talking wherever you want. This door is only closed for privacy. You, you can leave anytime you want, okay? Just let me know that ahead of time. How do you say your first name? E Z R A. What's your middle initial? J. And how do you say your last name, Miss? M C C A N D L E S S. 
Is there a date of birth? October 6, 1997. Do you have a phone number? Judge, I'm pressing pause, at, or excuse me, I'm muting it at 2018-38 until 2019-13 based upon an agreement that there's irrelevant demographic information that does not need to be displayed in court. So pressing the volume again. Josh Kados, obviously, was concerned about your safety and uh, Jason's safety. He was concerned that if he felt like he had having slept or had eight in days, and he didn't so know. I'm going to press pause to see if I can make it louder. Sorry, Madam Clerk, are we able to make it louder? We're up as high as we can go. Okay. Looks like mine is as well. Play again, Your Honor. You guys were tired from that, or you guys were exhausted from that. So that's our first concern: is make sure you feel okay physically. Mm -hmm. um, if you guys are, um, he also mentioned that you were uh, Jason's upset about something that happened to you that hasn't been reported reported yet. Okay. Um, again, if you don't want to talk about, it, that's fine. If you do, that's fine too. That's what I wanted to talk about. Okay. So we'll start with what you come up with as far as you, you told me that it happened here in Eau Claire, correct? You know where? It happened at, the first thing that happened was at Jason's house, and the second thing that happened was at John's house. Okay. Uh, we'll go with, um, what happened at Jason's house? At Jason's house, John grabbed me by the throat twice. Okay. Any reason why he did that? Because he liked him. He likes to do that? Like, is that like a, a fetish of his or? I think so. Okay. Was there any kind of warning sign that, like, did you, did you do something? Did you say something? Did he do something? Did someone else say something that, I was sitting on the counter after I made some coffee and I was talking to him and mm -hmm. he just grabbed me by the throat and no, nothing grew to me. Okay. And then the second time I got off the counter and he put me in a headlock and he held it there and it really <laughs> made me very uncomfortable. Some questions I may ask you, and they sound really redundant, very obvious, but these are questions that I have to ask just to get more you know, clarity as far as, for example, like you mentioned that he grabs you in the throat. Do you use a right hand or left hand or both hands? It was his right hand. When he grabs you the right hand, did he squeeze your throat, or did he just like, put his hand around your throat? Squeeze my throat forcibly. Okay. Did that cause you to have any trouble breathing? Yes. Okay. Did you lose consciousness at all? Did no. you black out? I felt, I felt really lightheaded after the second time. That was the headlock, right? Okay. Do you see any kind of those, like little fuzzy, shiny things floating around when that happens? Okay. Have you ever had that experience before where you show me some breath or you get a wind knocked out and you also mm -hmm. see like little like glaring things floating around? Mm -hmm. Okay, so but that didn't happen though. Okay. I just coughed a lot. Okay. Is it close to her now? Okay.
when he had his right hand on your throat, did you have to, how did you get away from that grab? And you just sat there and he let go. Okay. Were you hitting his hand at all? Were you telling him to stop? Were you telling him no? And this was quiet. I just grabbed his hand. Okay. He grabbed his wrist. Six foot something, really big. Okay. How long was there between when you were sitting at the counter and he grabbed your throat and then he let go? How long after that did he be in a headlock after you walked away from the counter? Suddenly. Okay. When he had in the headlock, was he where he was his left hand arm around you or was his right arm around you? Anything that you don't know, that's fine too. Like, if there's anything that you don't want to answer, or if you just want to take a few minutes and break and just kind of take your time, that's fine with me too, okay? If there's any questions that you don't feel comfortable with me asking, that's fine too. So don't be afraid to say, you know, like, I'm not comfortable answering that, or I don't want to talk about that, that's fine. It doesn't mean that you don't care, it doesn't mean that this isn't real, it's just take your time. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to rush you. Uh, if it feels like I am, just tell me, okay? When he had you in, his, in the headlock, did you also have trouble breathing? Okay. That's what made me cough. Okay. When you had, when he had you in the headlock, again, how did he, did you have to fight him off? Did he let go eventually? I put my arm up and he let go. Okay. Was there anyone there when this happened? Okay. And Ryan, you mentioned a counter at Josh's place. This is the kitchen. But, um, Jason's place. Jason's place. Okay. This the kitchen. Okay. Does Jason live here? Judge, I'm pressing pause at 20, 26, 26, uh, because there's irrelevant demographic information provided. I plan to press the sound again at 20, 26, 43 now. Okay, so after he grabbed a bit of rope with his right hand and the headlock, and he let you go up in the headlock, what happened after that? I just went and I sat down and then he acted like everything was normal. Okay. Did he say anything to you? Did he apologize? Did he... He didn't say sorry. Okay. Did he say anything else, did he say anything else to you during that time after you sat down? Now, when I say this, I'm not trying to accuse you or anything, but what was the purpose of you being at Jason's place that night? I was dating Jason. I'm oh, sorry? Jason is my boyfriend. Okay, so you and Jason are dating. Okay. 
that I did not know. So I just want to kind of clarify, you know, that makes a lot of sense why you were there. Why was John there? Because John was one of Jason's friends. He was my friend, and he came over because Jason was gone, and he wanted to just hang out and do art with me. Okay. So Jason was at home then during this time. Okay. sat down and John acted like it was okay. What happened after that? Jason came home and John got up and he left. Okay. How long was it when you sat down until Jason got home? It wasn't very long. Okay. Got home shortly. Did you tell Jason what happened? I told him everything tonight. Okay. But at that time when that happened, you didn't tell him. Okay. That's what he's so, so upset for me. Was there a reason you didn't tell Jason what happened that night or that day after you? Because I was really ashamed and I was really afraid. When this incident happened, did John touch anywhere else or did you make any permission to? Did he do anything else to you? Did he... I don't know. Okay. So as far as you know, is he just grabbed the throat and then put you in a headlock. And each one caused you to have trouble breathing, cough, but you did not black out with consciousness. Okay. Okay. So after John left and Jason came home, John left. The second incident happened that was at Josh's place? Was it John's house? John's house. When did that take place? That the next day, the same day? It was, I think it was a couple days later. When Jason had to leave for drill because he's in the army. Okay. And John wanted me to come over to his house to talk about everything and talk about stuff. And he bought wine and things. And I thought it would be okay to have some wine and just try to talk and try to understand what was going on. And then I got really, really, really drunk. And I was almost black up drunk. And I was throwing up, and he had me go upstairs when I started throwing up, and he took me upstairs, and he put me in his bed, and I was throwing up. <laughs> and I just remember a lot of, I don't know, it's a big mess of a bunch of fumbling and stuff, and it was awful. When you were in John's room, was the light on, light off? It was off. Now when you say fumbling around, was it like someone on top of you, someone laying next to you, or you... It was on top of me.
Did you for sure know it was John, or did it was just someone on top of you? It was John. Okay. When you felt this, what happened next? It's really hard to remember because of how drunk that I got. Okay. that you know of? No. Okay. There's no reason to use any protection. Okay. No protection? Did you fight, scratch, kick, or anything that you remember of? No. Did you say, try to get off? No. Did you try to, to you know, hold you down by force or do you remember anything like that? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. How do you feel sitting when you woke up? Where, do you know where you were when you woke up? Where were you? It was in Sean's bed. Do you remember having any clothes on? Blankets, cover sheets, anything like that? I had blankets on, but I didn't have my tights on or my socks. Were you wearing underwear that night? No. I don't know. Oh, you didn't have any on either? Okay. Did you have a shirt on or like a tank top or what did you have on top? I still had a dress on. Were you able to find those clothes that belong to you? Or were they located at? They were on the floor. And just kind of scattered. Where was John when you woke up? He was in the bed. Was he laying next to you on a different bed or? He was next to you. He woke up and he told me to get out of his bed and go lay in the other bed so that his roommate wouldn't think anything. Was the other bed in a separate room or same room? In a separate room. He told me he didn't want his roommate to think anything. the other bed or where did you go after that? I went to the other bed and I just laid there until the morning. When you woke up, was it still night time? Was it the next day already? It was the next day. Okay. When you went to, uh, do you remember what, what time you went to John's house?
think it was after he got done with work, so around 7. PM, AM? PM. Okay. When you woke up, know what time it was? It was really early. It was like, it was like at 5 or 6 in the morning. Okay. So you went to the other room around 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning? Okay. Um, but you went in there, you just laid there, correct? You said you laid it the next morning, or? I laid until, I laid there until he got up, and then so he could take me home. Okay, do you know what time that was? I think that was around, I think it was around 10 or 11. Okay, and John took you home? That's the thing Jason's most upset about is what happened at Jason's house after he took me home. Okay. You took all the way back home to Stanley, correct? Or where did you take Jason's house? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Did they happen on a ride home from John's place to Jason's place? They happened at Jason's place. Okay. No, they happened in the car at all. Oh, okay. So after John woke up and took you to Jason's place, what happened then? Yeah. I got there, and I thought Alex, our roommate, would be there, but he was at work. Mm -hmm. And I got there, and he told me to go upstairs to Jason's room because because he wanted me, because he because he wanted to do stuff to me under his bed. Because that's what he wanted. Because he he told me that that's what gets him off. to try to fast forward to 2049 minute mark when Mr. Vang returns eight minutes later from his current exit. Pressing play at 2048-41, Mr. Vang enters, I believe, in another 30 seconds. Right now. So I will call him shortly and see if he can come here again. Um, last enough thought, he told me that John brought you back to Jason's place. And that he told you to go upstairs because he gets off of that. Um, when you say, when he gets off on it, what do you mean by what happened up in Jason's bed?
regret it so much. I didn't want that to happen. <laughs> so wrong. Again, I'm not trying to say this to make you relive what happened, but when you say use me, what do you mean by that? Behind, do you mean like sexual intercourse? Okay. Did you know if he used his penis or did he use an object or his hand? He Uh, you mentioned earlier that you you said you felt that you had to do this because of what happened prior to this or Yeah. Okay. Do you know if he you mentioned that he didn't use protection either a time when it happened at his place and again at Jason's place. Do you know if he ejaculated inside of you or? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I couldn't afford plan B the next day and that's what I wanted to do. I'm sorry? I wanted to take plan B the next day but I couldn't okay. afford it. or did he go somewhere else? I 
And I really vividly remember it. I didn't like that. Judge, I'm stopping in at 20, 55, 54, and uh, I'm not, uh, the defense does not intend to play any uh, additional portions of the recording. You were in the courtroom when the uh, recording was played? Yes. And I think I misspoke before. This contact that you had with Ms. McCandless was on February 26th. Is that right? Correct. Okay. I don't know if I said it was on the 27th or the 26th before, but we're talking about February 26th, 2018. Agreed? Yes. And just to kind of give the big overview of things, you were responding to a check person call. Is that right? Yes. Um, and the check person call was in relation to a person named Jason Mengel. Agreed? Yes. There was another officer um, from Eau Claire Police Department named of Tyler Stevens that was also involved, correct? Yes. You and Mr. Stevens went there because Josh Trankler called the police to say he's worried about Jason Mengel, correct? Yes. And then you went there and you gathered some basic information, correct? Yes. Uh, in particular, you talked with or you heard somebody talking with Jason Mangle, right? Yes. Um, and what you came to learn is that he was extremely upset. Yes. Angry. Yes. Um, to s some extent, he was, Josh Trinkler had concerns about what he might do based upon his anger. Agreed? Yes. And you, uh, as part of that, then came to learn that uh, the emotional aspect of this was Jason was upset about what he believed had happened to Ezra McCandless. Agreed? Yes. So then Mr. Stevens stayed and spoke with Jason. Is that right, Mr. Mango? Yes. And then you, I don't want to say pulled aside, but kind of went to the side and spoke with Ms. McCandless briefly, right? Yes. Um, and asked her, basically, you're looking for the background to say what happened that made Jason so upset that Josh had to call the police about, it, right? Yes. Um, and Ezra said, well, let's go down to the station and we'll talk about it then, correct? Yes. But Ezra wasn't the one that called the police. Correct. All right. Um, she was asked by you if she was willing to talk to you about why Jason was upset, right? Yes. And then she agreed to do so, right? Yes. In the recording we just watched, um, there's, uh, I think there's a recording that lasts probably upwards of three hours. Is that fair to say? Yes, about three hours, yes. There's. Uh, you're in a room speaking with Ms. McCandless where you're gathering the facts that you can, right? Correct. And then at some point, um, well, you're in and out of the room, but at some point uh, you leave the room and Jason Mengel arrives and he's in there with Ms. McCandless, correct? Yes. Providing her comfort or care, those sort of things, correct? Yes. Support, right? Correct. Uh, and there's some time lag there where Ms. McCandless is waiting for other people to arrive. Is that right? Yes. Because you had told her there's a whole, is it a crisis response team that can show up and help women that are, uh, that need support in these situations? Yes. And you had told her about that, is that right? I did. And then you reached out to those contact people, agreed? Yes. And you told them to come to the Eau Claire Police Department? Yes. And then uh, those two women, eventually two women arrived, correct? <coughs> yes. And then uh, between when you interviewed Ms. McCandless and the two women from the crisis response team, that's the time that Mr. Mengel was in the room providing Ms. McCandless with 
emotional support. Agreed? Agreed. And then eventually the crisis response team is there, and that's all on tape as well, correct? Correct. And as a part of that, you've reviewed that whole tape, is that right? Yes. And as a part of that, you saw her being provided with um, a red folder, agreed? Yes. And that had all kinds of pamphlets for support for women in her position, agreed? Yes. All right. Um, so I want to go, that's, again, fair to say, a, a, a overview of what you had done that night. Yes. And when I stopped the recording, there's still, again, much more recording, but the fact gathering that you had done had essentially been completed at that point, right? Yes. All right. And you, um, how long have you been an officer? Five years. Do you have um, any specific training regarding the interviewing of victims of trauma? Just through what we learned at the academy okay. and experience. All right, but nothing in particular that you've been to any trauma training? No. Or no particular training in, uh, on how to interview victims of sexual assault? No. But through your five years, you've had experience of being in that position where you've spoken with other victims of abuse. Agreed? Correct. And your role there to begin with, you were trying to gather facts, right? Correct. You were trying to do it with the skills that you had to the best of your ability. Agreed? Yes. Um, and you did that by uh, being polite and asking soft questions, right? Correct. Giving her choice in some uh, autonomy. Agreed? Yes. As best you could, right? Yes. Um, but you were still asking her pointed questions, right? Yes. Um, because again, you were trying to gather the facts to see what you could, what she knew. Agreed? Correct. Um, in some of those times, you would ask pointed questions like, did this happen? <laughs> Correct? And fill in the blank. Agreed? Yes. Um, you didn't mean it in a manner of, like when you asked, did you fight or kick or scratch? You'd ask questions along those lines. Agreed? Yes. You certainly didn't mean any judgment by asking that question, right? That's correct. You're not implying that a woman in that situation is supposed to fight or kick or scratch, correct? Correct. Or that a woman in that position can't fight or kick or scratch, correct? Correct. You're just trying to gather facts. Yes. And you do that by asking these pointed questions about did this happen or did this happen, correct? Yes. Um, you, fair to say during that interview, never told her, can you tell me more about what happened? You never used that phrase, did you? Correct. Um, you didn't say, tell me more about that. Agreed? Yes. Um, they were, for the most part, these closed pointed questions that you thought were the most helpful way for you to gather facts. Yes. And when you, um, did that, she gave you answers, right? She did. Um, she talked about, I think has been characterized as, uh, three different events. Is that, that's what uh, it's been characterized thus far, right? Correct. I'm object to cumulative. We've watched the video of the interviews. Um, it's sustained and cumulative. I want to ask you some questions about that first portion of it, okay? Okay. Um, it's not unusual. You've investigated domestic abuse incidents before? I have. You've investigated sexual assault incidents before, correct? I have. It's not unusual in those incidents for there to be no witnesses other than the two participants. Objection right? relevance. It goes to relevance. I can follow it up here quickly. Well, I'm going to overrule. Go ahead, Mr. Nelson. Fair to say in your experience that there are typically not witnesses to those events. Agreed? Yes. Do you know this gentleman over here to my left with the blue shirt and the black tie sitting behind the prosecution team? I do. That's Investigator Proc? Yes, he is. He's somebody that works in your office? Correct. Um, and you're aware that after you conducted this initial fact-gathering interview, Eventually, Ms. McCandless met later on with Mr. Proc. Is that right? 
I'm not asking you the content. I'm just saying, are you aware of the fact that those two met to speak about the same incident that she spoke with you about? Not right away, but eventually, yes. As you sit here today, you're aware that that occurred? Yes. Um, and what Ms. McCandless described about the first incident was the, and I know it's, I'm just trying to get into the context, the uh, time when she says John Hansen put her hands on her throat or a headlock, right? Yes. Uh, are you aware that upon further investigation, the Eau Claire Police Department determined that there was actually a witness to that event other than John Hansen and Ezra McCandless? I did not know that. Okay. Um, <coughs> the, you asked Ms. McCandless about uh, how she responded in all three of these incidents, correct? Yes. Uh, and she described a situation in which there was no weapon involved in any way. Agreed? Agreed. She agree said that she never said John had a knife, did she? She never did. She never told you that she thought her life was threatened, did she? She did not. Um, you, um, she expressed to you in describing what was happening, or you asked her questions about her not reporting it, is that right? At least to her boyfriend or to others. Right? Yes. And she expressed to you her feelings of shame, right? She did. And again, that's not unusual that you've heard that when you speak with other victims of these types of events, agreed? Agreed. Um, she uh, responded to you at one point that she, quote, thought I was a piece of garbage for going to his home. Is that right? Yes. Uh, and at another point, she expressed to you, quote, I let him use me. Is that right? I'm going to object cumulative. It's Sustain. We can't repeat everything, Mr. No. So we have a time limit. And, uh, you know, we got to keep this moving. So I, I can't have you asking. The same question multiple times. I don't believe he has. There's three specific okay, quotes just, that please, I want. Just move on. Just move on. Uh, one of the things that she expressed that she was upset about that hasn't been asked about was her, she told you that he's telling everyone there wasn't sex. Agreed? Yes. Do you know if there was any additional investigation later to determine whether eventually John Hansen changed that? and admitted to having sex or not? I'm not aware of that. Okay. At the, um, when you were, just briefly, she told you at the end of all of this, at the end of the third incident, she went into what you, she said was shutdown mode, right? Correct. She used the term autopilot. Yes. And again, that's not unusual based upon your training and experience that you've had with other victims of assault to express a similar type of feeling. Agreed? Yes. That's all. Thank you. All right. Any redirect? Briefly, Judge. Uh, <clears throat> officer, it was a bit hard to hear the recording. Would you agree? Yes. And the testimony that you provided, either if it was hard to hear or if it was outside of that part that was played, your testimony was consistent with what you saw in the video and the additional portion that wasn't played, correct? Yes. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned that there were some questions about resources and information that was provided by two women who were part of a crime victim response team to the defendant, correct? Correct. So that information was, as you stated on cross-examination, information that let the defendant know there were resources if she was in a situation similar to this one that she described, correct? Yes. So if she was being interviewed by a male and she wanted to speak with women, she could have relied on those resources, correct? Objection, we approach. All right. yeah. Objection overruled. Do you remember the question? Can you repeat the question? Um, the information, there was information provided by two women from a crime victim response team to the defendant, correct? Yes. And that was uh, information about resources that she could call or reach out to if she was in a situation similar to this one in, a, in, a, in the future, correct? Objection, no foundation. He doesn't know what they told her. Overruled. 
Yes. And you have experience with uh, the crime victim response team in your employment, correct? Yes. Okay. So you're familiar with the general type of information that they provide? Yes. So uh, the information that was provided on February 26, 2018 to the defendant uh, provided her with resources that she could have relied on if she was in a similar situation or being in interviewed by a male or somebody else uh, in the future. Is that correct? Yes. Nothing further. Sorry, any recross? Just this issue about what resources were provided. When she met with the victim crisis response team, you weren't in the room, were you? No. You don't, uh, other than through, if you've watched the recording at the time, you didn't know what was told of, to her, correct? Correct. Um, when you conducted the interview, you didn't tell her, hey, if you want a female officer in here, you can do that, correct? Correct. Uh, yeah, and she, she acknowledged that she was okay speaking with you, correct? She did. But you never availed her of this uh, apparent opportunity that the state was alluding to that she could ask for a female officer. You didn't tell her that, correct? Correct. And you don't know what, if anything, she did with follow-up with people from the victim witness or the, the crisis response, do you? I do not. Um, you don't know if she went to Bolton House Refuge and spoke with people there? I do not know. You don't know what they told her? I do not know. You don't know uh, if she went to the Chippewa Falls Family Wellness Center and spoke with people there? I do not know. You don't know what they told her? Correct. Um, and you certainly understand that uh, any human being who's suffered for trauma may or may not be able to avail themselves of all the opportunities for help. Agreed? Agreed. Sometimes when people are suffering from that trauma in the moment, they can't necessarily ask for the help that they need, right? Objection calls for speculation. Yep. Sustained. Um, well, there's this uh, implication that you gave in your testimony that a woman who's been assaulted once should know in the future what she needs to do during some future assault. Is that what you're saying? Objection. I think that misstates the testimony and it's uh, sustained. I agree. That's certainly not what you're implying, is it? Repeat the question. You're not implying that because a woman was assaulted one time that they would absolutely know how to respond if that ever occurred in the future. Objection, uh, asked and answered, speculative. All right, I've already sustained the objection on that, so. Can we approach, Judge? No, I don't think we need to approach on that, uh, Mr. Nelson. So if you would uh, wrap up your recross. Um. The questions that were asked of you on redirect were about what was told to Ms. McCandless by crisis response workers. Agreed? Agreed. You don't know what was told of her. Agreed? Agreed. That's all. OK. Uh, Officer Vang, I believe you're free to go. Uh, anybody intend to recall Officer Vang? No. OK, you're free to go, sir, and free to step down. Thank, Thank you, Your Honor. for your time today, and uh, have a good day. Thank you. We have lunch. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to break for lunch. Uh, be a one-hour break. So, uh, all rise. Maybe. Okay, going back to again this most recent series of objections, as well as a sidebar, Mr. Nelson, why don't you go ahead? You can make a record as to what it is that you wish to elicit and why, and then uh, Mr. Hahn will have an opportunity to, uh, I guess, make a record as it relates to his objection. Judge, on redirect, the state asked um, questions getting into information that the witness said he didn't know about. I objected. They talked in general terms about that. I said once they go into that, I should have the opportunity on recross to then uh, speak about that same subject in a manner in which he would know or how a person was supposed to respond. The state went into that. I tried to ask those questions. I was shut down from asking those questions. I think it's relevant information. The state made asked questions that left an impression from this witness that a woman who has been assaulted 
would be able to or should know or needs to respond in a certain way either in the event of a second assault or in the event of an investigation of a second assault. It was not clear how that was done <coughs> on redirect. I was trying to clarify that. I was trying to follow up on that. My, my cross-examination of that witness was cut off. I believe in, I appreciate your honor's ruling, but I'm just making my record. I believe that it was impermissibly cut off, that I should be allowed to <coughs> cross-examine that uh, witness on what he did and didn't know and what uh, to clear up any negative inference or any uh, implicit argument that the state, I think, was making uh, in which uh, a woman who's been a victim of assault first uh, needs to respond later on in a particular manner. Okay, Mr. Hahn. Uh, there's been a lot made about whether or not female officers should have been involved in the interviewing of Ms. McCandless, including through this witness, and I was simply making that point that resources were made available to her. And when I thought that defense exceeded the uh, scope of that questioning and uh, was entering a place of speculation as to what sexual assault victims in general are required to do or con consistently do, um, I objected. I, just so it's clear, right. Judge, I never made any reference to female officers. I never said anything about a female officer. I laid out the facts. And the facts was, eventually, two women from victim witness came there. I didn't say why weren't they there before. I didn't leave any impression that there should have been a woman. I didn't ask him about female officers. I never went there. That wasn't a part of my cross-examination in any way, shape, or form. I laid out the facts that he spoke with her, and Jason Mangle spoke with her, and then people from the crisis response uh, team showed up. There was no implication about lack right. of female Judge, I could just be briefly yes, put on that. There's certainly an implication in the context of the other witnesses that have been cross-examined by defense counsel um, and the emphasis on, and then two women showed up to, to speak with uh, Ms. McCandless is certainly at least implying that there was uh, an issue with the gender of uh, the officer conducting the interview or at least that there should have been a possibility of a woman being involved. But the question that was then asked was, does Ms. McCandless, would she have known she could ask for a women officer? And that wasn't part of my cross. And there's no basis for them to ask that question when we don't know what the victim witness people told them. We don't know what told her. We don't know that they ever said, hey, if you're ever being interviewed by a male, you can speak with a female officer. She didn't speak with a female officer. She wasn't offered that. She spoke with other females about other matters that weren't part of the investigation, that were part of the support. So I think that misleads, misconstrues what the evidence was. All right. Well, in the sidebar, you mentioned also, Mr. Nelson, that this was burden shifting and so on and so forth. And the implication of your arguments has been, um, well, and, and going back to this line of questioning, um, this witness was called to present facts and you began going into again on your I believe it was your your cross-examination into areas uh, about trauma training and so on and so forth and again based upon as mr Hahn had indicated the context of other witnesses there's this implication or suggestion through your questioning it appears to the court uh, that the Eau Claire Police Department, male officers were insensitive uh, to issues of trauma, not trained in trauma, didn't have a female officer, although you didn't say that. Um, it, it, and it, it just, in the court's opinion, you're getting beyond uh, it, it appropriate cross-examination of this particular witness and using him for something outside of what he was called for. Um, and uh, in, in the court's opinion, waste of time, sort of confusing the issues. And uh, the court did not see here that the state was suggesting or that this witness was suggesting uh, that this is how a person should react or uh, in the future if there was another assault. The officer is simply testifying that resources were provided, that a procedure was followed to have a crisis response team uh, in a sexual assault situation uh, uh, come in and, and he's offering services 
Uh, that's all that happened, and, and I don't think we need to go beyond that. The court's opinion is a waste of time, and I didn't want this officer, again, to be used uh, as part of an overall uh, campaign in this trial about uh, how Ms. McCandless was mistreated uh, because of uh, you know male officers interviewing her about a sexual assault. Can I just, there's no campaign on the defense that Ms. McCandless was mistreated. The state, as part of their theory, is alleging that Ms. McCandless shouldn't be believed because she didn't initially disclose this. It's the state that is attacking her credibility, and the defense is simply saying, here's some things that you should consider. We're not blaming anybody. We're just laying out facts. So we have not been on a can't remember what your honor just called it, but uh, I, a campaign. I uh, well, maybe respectfully I, disagree with that. Uh, perhaps a better term. Perhaps a better term could be used. But this witness, this evidence is, as Mr. Nelson, you very well know, is offered for purposes of the background and the facts and circumstances surrounding uh, the weeks that led up to the event on March 22nd, 2019. Um, this is not being received simply for a, to show that this was a false report of a sexual assault. Um, the, the facts are what they are, and uh, that's, this witness is just a background witness, panorama witness, and, uh, and so it, it limited your inquiry into those particular areas on this witness, and it's just as simple as that. Um, all right, now that takes care of, I believe, that sidebar, unless there is anything else that you would like to say about that. No. All right, there was uh, I think we can address other sidebars later. later. I think we're going to recess for lunch. All right. I believe after lunch, the state manager calling Julia Post and prior to the jury coming back after lunch, the defense would uh, just like an offer of proof. There's, I, I, maybe we can do it on the side. I don't know what she's going to testify, but certainly her previous interviews have in, contained lots of inadmissible evidence. So perhaps we'll just discuss it with them, but. Judge, I can move this along. We're not calling Julia Post. Fair enough. Uh, the right. next witness will be Jason Mengel. We do have some legal issues that need to be sorted out. I think relatively quickly, uh, Attorney Vishni is handling that and she's not here, so we can, I can meet with her briefly over lunch and finalize exactly what we have to address and we'll bring it to the court. Very good. Okay, we'll be in recess until- Judge, Sorry, just two more things. Um, court TV stopped me. They want a copy of the journals. I'm, you know, I told them to talk to the court about it as well. <clears throat> is we haven't discussed the cautionary instruction regarding this other acts evidence. I'll leave it to the court as to just wanted a reminder that I didn't know when you were intending to instruct the jury regarding, you know, it contains some information relating to the John Hansen matter, so I didn't know when Your Honor was going to, or if and when Your Honor was going to give a cautionary instruction. Well, the cautionary instructions for the jury, not necessarily for those who are watching a public trial. Um, those exhibits are public exhibits and exhibits. But they won't be ready until after the trial's done. Well, okay, so. Um, I'm sure that the council will be referring to these exhibits and the content of these exhibits and closing arguments. So, um, all right, we're in recess until 1.20. Okay, um, you'll have a moment. I have a couple of things. We're back on the record. Okay, uh, during, the, uh, uh, during the break, uh, learned that there's a request uh, from the media for uh, the exhibits related to the journals that were sort of privately published to the jury and uh, specifically exhibits uh, two, I'm sorry, 365 as redacted and uh, 366. And uh, the court uh, was anticipating that to be published by the state through the uh, media presentation, uh, and it, it was not. There, was, uh, there were copies of that exhibit, both exhibits provided to the jury. 
But in the, uh, the spirit of Wisconsin statute section 757.14, which requires the sitting of every uh, court to be public, uh, as well as the uh, state of Wisconsin or state ex rel lacrosse tribune versus circuit court for lacrosse county case. Uh, that's reported at 115 Wisconsin 2nd 220. It's a 1983 case um, in the court's opinion. And I just sort of a personal editorial. One of the reasons that I pressed for confidence monitors in courtrooms and screens was because uh, if those attending or if the media can't see the exhibits, then it really isn't a public trial. There are reasons to keep some things from public view uh, for avoid undue embarrassment or humiliation. Uh, or there is, frankly, some inappropriate con con content. It, it specifically, those uh, exhibits with showing the pr private genital areas and so forth in the folders. I, that's not going to the media. I think that is appropriate. I think it was described. There were drawings. Um, so, however, the court believes that those exhibits I've just referred to, um, there's no reason that they should not be provided to the media. Uh, we're not going to be in a position to honor public records requests um, generally uh, during, during the course of this trial, but because the media does hold a special place recognized in the law because they are reporting on behalf of the media, or I'm sorry, on behalf of the public, uh, the court is going to uh, order that those exhibits be provided to media covering the trial if they request. There's also a request for the exhibits related, the three exhibits related to the DNA analysis. Um, as it relates to those exhibits, um, we have not yet uh, come up with a redaction. Uh, my thoughts at this point in time would be that if on exhibit 554, which contains the portions where there was considerable argument and uh, a stipulation uh, that the uh, text in those sections and the corresponding uh, letters or item numbers uh, that essentially that that area be whited out and the word stipulation be put in its place. And I just want counsel to think about that, but I'm not going to have those exhibits released until we do come up. Your Honor, there's a, a, a number of other uh tests that were done on other items that were submitted for evidence that were not brought up. They're not really relevant to this case. Uh, we would, and weren't, uh, they weren't testified about. There was, uh, uh, you know, so I think those items should also be redacted, the ones that were not testified about. All right, and I think what I'll do is give, uh, again, the parties, because this has come up on short notice, but I'll give the parties an opportunity to think about that overnight in terms of an appropriate redaction for those exhibits. But I believe that those parts of the exhibit that were received in evidence at, in one way or another uh, should be provided, will be provided to the media with appropriate redaction. Uh, but we obviously don't have time to do all of that right now. We have to keep this, uh, keep the trial moving. And uh, so. Uh, are we ready for the next witness? Good. We have a couple legal issues that we needed to address before All right. Mr. Mangles called. Um, first, I just wanted to let the court know, I think there was a misunderstanding of what Attorney Nodoff was mentioning prior to our break about a cautionary instruction as it relates to other acts evidence. It was mentioned in the context of court TV. There were two separate thoughts, however. The cautionary instruction was whether or not an instruction should be read because we just heard some what would be considered other acts evidence. Um, but as long as the courts, it's on the court's radar, I know we haven't sorted out what exactly the instruction would be. I think the state is fine having that read later as part of the, the broader jury instruction reading to the, to the jury. All right, Mr. Nelson. Uh, Ms. Fishney. I'm sorry, Judge, I was looking for something. I didn't think it was pertinent what I was waiting for. All right, well, there was, uh, there was uh, some discussion about uh, a cautionary instruction, and uh, obviously a jury will be given instructions at the close of the case. I have improvised one instruction basically as it relates to what evidence is, so they would have some idea of that before we, uh, before the court advised them of 
the stipulation and judicially noticed facts. However, we've now gone into what would be considered other uh, acts type of evidence. And panorama evidence is sort of a special part of that. It's a little bit different, but it, the same analysis, I think, applies. But no cautionary instruction has been provided to the jury on why they are hearing that evidence. Uh, does the defense request that there be some sort of instruction given before instructions at the close of the case? Yes. Not right now. All right, then that's something we'll, we'll take up. Uh, However, and, at, at a later time, and I just, I, I haven't, did you provide us with a draft of what you wanted? No, and it, we have not, um, it wasn't something we were pushing to have done now. I just wanted to make sure that the court was aware of it so defense was able to have input on whether or not it should be read now or read at a later time. We should definitely right. take that up. I just don't think I, I just said it's ready to take it up right now, Judge. Very well. So that's just to give you a heads up that we will um, take that up. And I, I think periodically it's not a bad idea. Uh, to do that so that they under, get some understanding of why they're hearing that evidence. And okay. J Judge, I just need to talk to, um, I'm a little confused about something. If I can just talk to Mr. Hahn for a minute before Go ahead. objection on the record. I apologize. I feel like I'm Which might one are you looking at? I'm just, the state gave me, uh, Mr. Hahn was good, kind enough to give me some exhibits in advance that he's going to use. And <coughs> I'm not seeing them. Um, so I asked Mr. Maxey to see if I left them in the other room, Judge. But regardless, um, I can put an objection on the record or ask for a ruling right now on another matter, which is the state has advised me that it intends to introduce various um, things that were, I can't find it. No, I don't have it. Um, the state intends to use various pages uh, of screenshots that I believe, and, and Mr. Hahn should correct me if I'm wrong, there are some screenshots that Jason Mangle took of Ezra McCandless's um, iPod or of her Instagram account, no matter what the device was. And the state intends to enter them as an exhibit. I don't know if there's, are they, are these numbers on the bottom of the page, different exhibit number for each? Yeah, it's page. 473 through 476. Correct. And I think what I'll do is just give them to your honor to look at for a minute so right. you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so these are sort of hand numbered. They haven't been numbered. They're hand numbered with the exhibit numbers that the state intends to introduce. So basically what this is is that my understanding is that Mr. Mangle looked at Ezra McCandless's Instagram and screenshotted these from her Instagram. The people who are purportedly talking on those Instagram pages, as I understand it, are John Hansen and Ezra McCandless. And this content, which is on there, can best be described as flirtatious. I'll just use that word for right now, between Ms. McCandless and Mr. Hansen. And I am objecting to the relevancy of the, those messages that were between these two individuals. First of all, as to Mr. Hansen, the state has chosen to not call Mr. Hansen. I've been told he's not being called as a witness, possibly in rebuttal, but not in the state's case in chief. Um, so anything that Mr. Hansen says is hearsay. Now, I'm going to anticipate that the state is saying that they are only introducing Mr. Hansen's statements in order to give context to Ms. McCandless's statements. Therefore, I continue my objection to argue that Ms. McCandless's flirtatious statements towards John Hansen do not belong in this trial in the state's case in chief. The court has ruled that Ms. McCandless's sexual conduct with Mr. Hansen is permitted as panorama evidence, and we have had evidence of this both through 
Officer Vang, who took a statement from Ms. McCandless, and, and I think probably more central to the prosecution's case, the journal's silence broken in Journal 2, which the state opines is some <clears throat> evidence of Ms. McCandless's emotional turmoil. And as I understood the court's ruling, the court permitted that to be proffered in the state's case in chief as evidence of Ms. McCandless's state of mind, emotional turmoil, and panorama of the events leading up to Alex Woodward's death. However, her specific flirtations with John Hansen and her comments do constitute other acts evidence. My understanding is that the state attempted to proffer these in its case in chief as some kind of evidence that Ezra McCandless was not truthful about what she said to the police about what happened sexually between her and Mr. Hansen. My understanding was the court was not going to allow evidence to be elicited for any purpose of arguing that Ms. McCandless was not credible or purportedly had made some kind of false claim of sexual assault to the police. So I can't frankly grasp what is relevant about her flirtatious texts to Mr. Hansen, which were screenshotted by Jason Mangle, how that helps to prove or disprove a fact and issue in this particular case. These are matters between her and Mr. Hansen, this flirtation. This has nothing to do with what happened between her and Alex. If the state is arguing these go to her credibility, she hasn't testified in this case at this juncture, and they simply should not be permitted into evidence. That's my argument. <coughs> okay, uh, who would like to handle that argument? For the I state? will, Judge. Uh, first, as to the hearsay, I, they're not being offered, Mr. Hansen's statements are not being offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted, so I think that's pretty clearly not hearsay. If the court finds that they're, it, it, that it is being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, those are adoptive admissions by uh, the defendant by acknowledging and responding to the statements that are made by Mr. Hansen. And really, it's um, this is a segment of what was included in the the state. The defense filed a motion in limine trying to exclude all of the message messages contained on Mr. Hansen's or provided by Mr. Hansen as it relates to his relationship with the defendant. These are only a portion of those because this is what was pulled from Jason Mengel's phone, not the entirety of the messages John Hansen provided. Um, this, the court has found that the relationship between the defendant and Mr. Mengel, as well as the defendant and Mr. Hansen, is relevant to this case for certain purposes. And these messages are how Mr. Mengel came to be aware of the relationship between the defendant and Mr. Hansen when he observed these and then screenshotted them on his phone. They were initially observed on her phone and that's why he saw them and took photographs. Um, the messages come after the believed date of the sexual encounter that we've heard a little bit about and I expect there will be more testimony about between the defendant and Mr. Hansen. So I think it shows it's relevant for a number of purposes, state of mind, uh, the relationship between the defendant and Mr. Hansen, but more importantly, the relationship between the defendant and Mr. Mengel and the information she provided Mr. Mengel um, and how that meshes or doesn't mesh with the information contained in the text messages. The defense argument that the defendant would somehow need to testify before her credibility can be attacked just certainly isn't how court cases work. Credibility of somebody who's provided statements, a defendant who's provided statements to law enforcement or anybody else prior to trial and those statements are being admitted, um, those statements can certainly be attacked on the credibility basis. So she doesn't have to testify before her credibility becomes an issue as it relates to statements she's made prior to trial. So I think one, it's not hearsay, Two, it's relevant, it fits within the, the provisional rulings of the court, and uh, 
Three, I don't, th I think the credibility issue doesn't have to be addressed only once she testifies. Judge, if I can just very briefly respond to the state's argument. Go ahead. What, what I would like to say is, do I think that, for example, her um, statements that she gave Investigator Proc uh, or Detective Proc regarding what happened with Alex, that they can show that there are inconsistencies or differences of things she said to him? Yes, of course they can. But this is just for a general attra attack on her credibility as a person. And that kind of general attack of a witness who testifies for truthfulness may be inquired under 90608 sub 2 upon cross-examination of a witness and when they are questioned about matters related to their truthfulness as a witness under 90608 sub 2 the cross-examiner must quote unquote in the words of M. Winkle Reed take the answer um, that's a pretty black letter law so I would argue that these are for a general attack on her credibility, not her statements regarding the alleged offense in this case, the homicide of Alex Woodworth, number one. Number two, if the evidentiary purpose for the state is to show that this created a fissure or a problem in her relationship with Jason Mangle, which was part of her state of mind, which is what the state argued in its opening, then all the state has to do, and I would not object to them leading, is say, you read her Instagram, there were some things that upset you. Through reading this Instagram, you believed that your girlfriend had sex with your friend John, and the two of you were arguing about this, and then this is what she told you happened. The substance of those actual messages which again, I argue, are not relevant to anything except for Ms. McCandless's credibility, in which case she can be cross-examined, but the, our extrinsic evidence on a collateral matter should not be permitted into evidence. Thank you. All right, well, first of all, I do not see these exhibits as being uh, 90608 sub two extrinsic evidence, and this is not where witnesses being cross-examined on credibility, and they are, they're not, uh, as the court made clear in the provisional ruling, uh, not offered uh, related uh, to credibility. And however, I did say uh, that if this panorama evidence comes in, it may have the effect, but that's not the purpose for which it's offered. Now, um, we have in this case already, and I'm not gonna comment on what evidence may come in because it hasn't come in yet, but at this point, uh, I think it's, we have evidence that Ms. McCandless went to talk to Mr. Woodworth on March 22nd about her feelings. She went, and I think this came in through one of the officers, perhaps Officer Reeves. One of the things she wanted to talk about was the investigation. Uh, and the name John Hansen had come up. Uh, and in court believes that these messages are are very relevant, um, and uh, in particular, when you look at exhibits, the journals, and I wanna refer to them by their exhibit numbers. I'm sorry, I don't have all of these exhibits. Exhibit 365, silence broken. Uh, Exhibit 366, uh, Journal 2. In both of those exhibits, there is uh, reference by the defendant uh, to pain, regret, disgust, shame, waves of guilt. Um, and uh, And from uh, exhibit 365 in particular, on the uh, second to last page, uh, makes reference to the extreme guilt, I'm quoting, the extreme guilt I felt because of the betrayal I had committed against the love of my life 
uh, drove me to start self-harming again. I think in a nutshell, um, these messages are at the heart of that. And without a jury seeing the actual messages in the court's opinion, it would be difficult for them to understand the context, uh, understand the significance of uh, exhibits 365 and 366. Um, so again, these are, uh, these in the court's opinion are very relevant evidence to those very strong feelings uh, that Ms. McCandless had. And uh, I think uh, that they are very relevant. I do not believe that they are hearsay. They're not offered for the truth of the matter asserted in the sense of what Mr. Hansen said, but um, certainly for what uh, the defendant said as her statements. And uh, so uh, the court is going to allow exhibits 473, 474, 75, and 76, assuming that's what the actual exhibit, th that will be the numbers, Madam Clerk. So these should be marked as an exhibit since I'm referring to them. Otherwise, we're going to be. Judge, I think the, the stamp at the bottom, it's very small, but it actually does have the courts. Well, it has, it has someone wrote in handwriting and numbers, but we need exhibit stickers to correspond so that we're not. So we're keeping it, it's very right. tiny above it. It says plaintiff's exhibit. I certainly think we could, I'll leave it to the clerk, obviously, but. Okay, well, we, we would like to have our court exhibit stickers on these. Uh, that's, That's fine. Just, Those are my copies, though. Okay. So, I'm assuming the state has another copy to give the court. Well, I, I want to make sure that <laughs> what I'm referring to, what I have in my hand, will be just exactly the same as the uh, those court exhibits. So, okay. Judge, I can give a copy, a separate copy, to Attorney Vishni if you want to keep those as the what will be marked. That would be fine. Uh, that would be fine with me. Madam Clerk, there are numbers on them, so okay. I'll give those to you. Work. No, I think Mr. Hahn is going to give them to Ms. Vishni, and we'll use these copies. Yes, that's fine. Judge, there's one other matter. The state has another exhibit it's giving to the court. And I, I don't have an exhibit number on it yet. Um, it is an Instagram business record that the state has provided count me with a copy of. And it starts at page Instagram, page 975. And the last page number is page 983, though I will advise the court that those are backwards numbers to how the conversation actually occurred. Um, and that the end of the conversation is actually at page 975. Um, and I'm not objecting to the majority of this um, conversation, but there is one point in the conversation near the end. Is this, is this uh, identified as an exhibit yet? No. Does the state have an yep. exhibit prepared? It is, Judge. It says Plaintiff's Exhibit 465. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a, there, again, there's not a sticker on it, but I have, there is uh, something noted at the bottom of the page. Okay, well, I, I would like to get these marked as exhibits before we start having extensive that, discussion. That would be great. Them. I'll just wait until it's marked and that you can see what I'm looking, what I'm talking about, because it's a very small point. Judge, would you like a copy? Uh, yes, please. This is the one that marked. You want that one? Uh, sure. I'll take that one. Okay. Madam Clerk, let's mark these. This is this whole packet would be Exhibit 465. Yes. Okay. We'll have it marked first. And, um, I, okay, go ahead, Mr. I have an apology to Mr. Hahn because I hadn't caught this until just now, and I don't even know if he would agree to take this out. But if you look on page 976, which is the second page, and the conversation begins at the bottom of the page with, I doubt he'll get a word in. And, Judge. <clears throat> If you look at page 976, if you go up almost to the top, Jason sends a text to 
Ezran says, don't use racial words in text ever. And I really don't know what this refers to because the only racial word that had been used had been previously by Jason. You talk like Rican or however that's spelled, but I'd ask that that be deleted. I don't understand it, but. <clears throat> but some kind of implication that Miss McCallis was saying something racial, or I don't know if you meant to say racist, but it just seems kind of <coughs> irrelevant and inappropriate to me. Well, there's uh, and I, on that page, just below the middle, there's a text. The author of that is. Uh, Assuming that that's Mr. Mango, says you talk like, and then continues. Can you see that line? Yes, and is the author of that? And if, Judge, before we state the author, the the Instagram name on the record in open court, I would like to take some precautions to make sure that those aren't included as well. So I think if we can agree, I think Attorney Vishney and I know who. Mr. Mengel is in these conversations, so I'm fine if she just refers to that being Mr. Mengel's conversation. All right, so. Um, I, I think it's his, unless I have it wrong. Mr. Hahn, if I have it wrong, I believe the person whose name appears as the author directly under that line is the author. It is. Am Judge, I correct? It, yes. Okay, so the author is Jason Mengel. And by the way, Ms. McCandless's Instagram name was used by the state in its opening statement, and it's in evidence. Um, so I see no reason why Mr. Mangle's Instagram name should not be allowed in evidence. It doesn't have it, do, it doesn't have his actual real name. It's a pseudonym or an Instagram name. I'm not, and I, I see no reason why it should not be permitted. Well. The question isn't whether it will be permitted. The question is whether it's something that's going to be subject to being broadcast. Oh, OK. But we can use it in front of the jury. It's just that Core TV can't broadcast it? Well, I'm not going to tell them what they can or can't broadcast. It's a public trial. I mean, that's, okay. folks, as much as people would like to do things in private, we don't do things in private. So again, we'll protect personal identifying information. Uh, Again, a phone number is one thing. Mr. Mangle complained that he was getting text messages and calls and so forth. But Instagram names, and I'm sorry, I'm not that familiar with how Instagram works, um, but if someone knows someone's Instagram account, how can that be harmful to them? Is it going to blow up their account? Judge, I don't have Instagram, but I believe it's essentially the, the new age telephone number. So somebody who goes on Instagram could send messages just like they could a text message directly to that person. And if somebody knows better, they can correct me, but. I believe there's privacy controls that somebody's well. able to just make their account private. And so it's certainly within the control of the account owner to decide whether or not they want to open it to the public or not. And so. It's All right. Well, and if I could judge, the only reason I'm bringing this up now and it wasn't raised before opening statements is because we didn't have the issue with Mr. Mengel being contacted by however many people contacted him until after opening statements were made. Uh, well, I understand. I understand. It's uh, so it's just something I think, you know, right. But you, you can't set your account to private. You, you can choose to use your own name, you can use a pseudonym, you can have it set to private, people can't find you unless you friended them. That, that's what happens with Instagram, just like Facebook. You can set Facebook to private and people can't see what you're posting on it. All right, so where, where does that leave us then? Is the state requesting that? It, I mean, I don't, it'll be on the exhibit. Uh, it is on the exhibit, I guess, We've already have Ms. McCandless name on there. And I believe uh, in other hearings and other exhibits, we have that Instagram account uh, for Mr. Mangle. So frankly, I'm just going to let that go. Then we'll have the records be as they are, and he can adjust his privacy settings. <coughs> so I don't see it as the same as a phone number, or date of birth, or address, physical address. OK, with that, are we ready for Mr. Mangle? 
Judge, I don't know that the issue with the... I don't think we resolved the issue, that's right. So what is the issue, Ms. Vishni? What is it that you're... I, I'm asking for him to not chastise her about being racial. Judge, and if I, the way I read it is that he's basically acknowledging to himself he used a racial word oh. and he shouldn't, he's, like, he's basically saying, oh, whoops, don't do that. That's how I read it. If, if that's what he's going to testify to, I don't have a problem with that's that. That's what I, I anticipated. I thought he was saying that Ms. McCandless was doing that. No, I don't believe that will be the testimony. Okay. If so, you want to ask him before we start, that's fine. I don't have an issue. No. Issue, I, as far as I'm concerned, issue is resolved. Let's, All right. let's get going. We're okay. Very good. Burning, burning time. Burning daylight is something. Burning daylight. Mm -hmm.